good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to season two, episode one. Wow, season two eh? of our weekly podcast, Just Politics, Our Worldview, where we discuss politics in Barbados, the region, and the rest of the world. Remember that you can find us here every Sunday from 5 to 7 p.m. I miss you guys so much, and I know that you missed us too. I saw your messages and and post here and skin about when we were returning and it really warmed my heart. Those of you who private messaged me and say that you were really missing the show, you know, it made me feel good that we were we are making a difference um, by being here with you on Sunday evenings. Thank you also, Sasha Lee, for keeping this space active during our short break. And thank you guys once again for joining us and welcome again to our show. I am your host, Ayo Olalara, and this is my co-host, Dr. Terry Harris. Over to you, Terry. Thanks, Ayo. Hi, guys. Welcome back to another season of Just Office or Worldview. So this week, we have planned a very interesting conversation with Dr. Don Marshall from the University of the West Indies. Um, I will introduce him a little bit later. But this week, this week's episode is brought to you by Desert Properties, Inc., Constructing the Future. You can contact them at 624-0593 or email them at desertpropertiesinc at icloud.com. So one more time. This week's episode brought to you by Desiree Properties Inc. Constructing the future. Again, email them at 624-0593. Well, call them at 624-0953 or email them at Desiree Properties Inc. at iCloud.com. And please, please stay tuned for the next segment, which is Hot Topics, a new segment by IO. IO? Thank you, Terry. And uh, yes, hot topics. That's what we're calling it this, this season. So much has happened since we um, met here last year. Um, we were actually wishing that um, we didn't take that break. Well, me at least. <laughs> so. <laughs> Not Terry so much. But I can't tell you how many times I thought that we should just cancel everything and go live because so much was happening. There was so much havoc politically in the world and we were on a break on a political show, but you know, it is what it is, but we're back, and we're so happy to bring you Hot Topics. So right now, there are three new strains of, strains of coronavirus in the UK. Um, there's the UK strain, which was the first one, then there's the Brazilian strain, and then the South African strain. Um, it's absolutely crazy right now. Um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he announced a new lockdown with no, I guess, with no flights. What's going on, Terry? Um, yeah, so returning, individuals returning back to the UK um, from places like Barbados will now have to um, return with a negative COVID test, if not, don't return, and still quarantine, be self-isolated um, at a hotel at their own expense for at least 10 days. So those are new, new requirements. No more safe travel car corridors. <laughs> right. I mean, this is sure to have some implications on our um, already dwindling tourist market. Um, they've been called um, for a while now in Barbados for us to, to go on a lockdown as well, uh, well before this happened. And, you know, I, not, I, I didn't agree with us going on lockdown. I still don't agree with it. The rest of the world has essentially locked down. For us, our tourist market is locked down, so we know what that means. But what I did agree with at the time was, I guess, greater protocols at the port of entry, ports of entry, and um, better security and management of those persons entering quarantine and isolation. I feel like um, that would have prevented the issues um, that we're dealing with right now. Over the, the past few weeks, we've had tourists um, breaking quarantine and isolation protocols and you know, and uh, that's where the, I think, to my mind, the root of our problems came. I mean, what do you call two bricks on a Jamaican, Terry? <laughs> Three know, people, a couple, I don't know. What do you call them, Mario? Well, we had a situation in Barbados just over a week ago when a British couple who were on quarantine invited um, a Jamaican sex worker um, to scale the wall at their hotel and uh, to join them for a manage a trois. It, you know, it seems like they're eventually tested negative, although we don't really know because that was never actually confirmed to the public, but I hope they did. The Jamaican woman is now missing. Um, it's said that she returned to Jamaica or left the island, right on the island, I don't know. 
but I sincerely hope that she's okay and I hope that she was well paid for what she had to endure. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, right? People, um, we do what we do. Um, look, everybody wants to come to Barbados. And I, I understand that, you know? Who, who wouldn't want to escape the cold of Narnia to spend time in paradise? <laughs> but you have to follow the protocols. You're entitled to our, gym, our, our, our to your um, vacation, but you're also entitled to our safety. A small island like ours can become uninhabited in, in one fell swoop <laughs> um, from a, a reckless virus. We've been welcoming visitors for some time, and yes, the tourist dollars help our economy. But if it was left to us, we will choose our health and our lives. So by all means, if you want to travel and you get to travel um, now and get away in a pandemic, do so. And if you want to horse around and you want to manage a tour, <laughs> do so. But exercise some basic common sense and spare a thought, a thought for the, the residents of the, the, the countries that you go to, you know? Mm. Um, and at least we're a mass like this guy, right? Yeah, we're a mass like my guy here, the last well, one. Probably not like this guy, but at least we're a mass. <laughs> but he had fun here. He had a ball. <laughs> um, yeah, and some of you were messaging me to ask how I feel about the government paying hotel stay for folks who don't return their test results, who don't receive their test results in within 72 hours. And I didn't necessarily respond because I wanted to respond on the show. Um, to be honest, I feel like it's a fix for a problem that we imagine that we will have in the future, but that won't actually exist. Um, you know, one of the areas that I studied was um, public relations and uh, what PR is, is usually responding to issues um, to soften their impact. And most of the times when you respond um, as a PR practitioner, you're responding after the event has taken place and um, all you're able to do is soften the impact. But Great PR um, is really about anticipating future problems that can come about from um, current actions and, and try to prevent either the action from happening or if you can't prevent it, then you soften um, the message that, um, that, 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 that it comes with to the public. And uh, it seems to me that this is what somebody was trying to do here. And I must say that I believe that they got this one wrong completely. And for a number of reasons, number one, the financial element. Um, Barbados bought vaccines at, an, um, at market prices and they're testing everyone for free, including tourists, right? Tourists also have the option to isolate free or pay. And uh, from where I stand, um, it seems to me that most are opting for paid to, to isolate um, on their own time in hotels or in villas. Um, tourists also chose to drop to travel during a global pandemic. And I mean, if you're making this choice, then you have to, and, and, and this, I mean, you have to anticipate delays and, and changes, especially if you're traveling to a small island developing state that will lack the resources of larger states. Now, yes, I can understand the government assisting on a case by case basis, but a sweeping policy to pay hotel costs or refund tickets I feel is absolutely unnecessary because most travelers right now, I believe they're doing so, they're traveling on refundable tickets, right, Terry? That's right. Both Virgin and um, British Airways, particularly out of the UK, they have you know, very flexible um, ticketing policies at this point in time. So there really isn't much of a case to be made that tourists, you know, if, we, if Barbados is unable to get a quick turnaround in testing for tourists, that is somehow um, affects their travel, their, their ability to travel back on time it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right. And additionally, I mean, for me personally, I feel like the whole thing just feels wrong in a, in a situation where many Barbadians are out to work and they're not making an income. It feels kind of icky to grant uh, free vacations to people who can afford to travel and not just travel, but travel during a global pandemic, right? Um, it just feels wrong. And I, I know that um, we, we, we have a, a government that it wants to or, or wants to just be on the right side of things and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that let me just say that right 
um, so and this is why I think a case by case um, approach is better than a sweeping policy. Uh, right, look, so I think that better pay should be paying for PCR tests with the profits going towards helping to maintain testing um, isolation and quarantining facilities. Um, and, and, you know, things like that, just to, 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 to boost, bolster, that's the word, bolster our resources and that make everything a little bit um, more easier um, for everyone. I truly hate the subservience built into and pass through generations of our tourism sector. We don't have to bow down to everything. And I work in this sector, you know, um, um, so I, I am not saying it from some, as some person on outside, but when I provide my service to a tourist, I provide it in, in as much in this, well, not in as much, the same way as I provide it to anybody else. And, and my reviews are great um, without me having to be subservient to, to visitors. Um, Terry, though, you are in the UK and uh, you, you've been following the news here in Barbados and visitors flouting our protocols. Um, yeah, I've been listening to Zara. Huh? I've, been, I've been reading all about Zara and her escapades in Um Well, to be honest with you, I, yeah. Well, to be honest, right? Um, the idea that here in Britain we would care about tourists who probably broke the um, lockdown rules to travel to Barbados, a paradise, you know, during a global pandemic, I had to spend a few extra days locked up in a four-star, five-star hotel. The fact that the idea that we would really care about that it would affect our opinion of Barbados is actually quite laughable, to be honest with you, right? Just yesterday, we had um, 1,300 COVID deaths yesterday. The NHS is running out of um, intensive care beds, and, right, and I'm not allowed to leave my home for anything other than essential travel. So I'm quite sure that neither the right wing or left wing press will have any sympathy for tourists who have to spend a couple extra days locked up and like I said, a four-star, five-star hotel is really, it's really a joke. You know, I, I get my violin out for them every every single time. Yeah. So, do you, do you, what do you think? Do you think a few bad, a few um, some bad press from a few people here it would be detrimental to our industry survival? I don't think that Barbados would get any bad press. That's that's the thing about it. But right now, the UK has bigger fish to fry. Like I said. Um, every we, the entire country is under lockdown, so you're not allowed. To, you're not allowed to leave home. Why should we care about individuals who, during a global pandemic, as you said, were able to travel to a paradise? Just yesterday, we had London had what is it? London was blanketed in snow, right? And we have individuals who are locked up abroad in Barbados. You know, <laughs> the sun, the sea. I mean, come on, be serious. I don't think. I I mean, we're not, we're not, um, sorry, cross crossing, but you're not, mi you're not minimizing what they're going through. But uh, if we're just looking at it in relation to our response to it, you are traveling during a global pandemic. Expect some inconveniences, inconveniences. And when you really consider the situation that's happening in Barbados, Barbados, why, if you ask the, the question, why was Barbados unable to respond to these individuals in this 72 hour time frame? Well, Barbados had a, a, an outbreak of COVID brought to it ostensibly by these same said tours. Right? So Barbados was dealing with a major outbreak of, 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 of COVID and of course had to prioritize the testing of you know, the individuals at the prison and so on and so forth. So it's quite reasonable, I think, that there will be some delay in getting back to the tourists, um, these, these results as we deal with uh, an outbreak of COVID there in Barbados. So I, on, I, I really don't think that once that is explained to the wider British public, that they would care, right? And the, when these individuals return to the UK, they're going to have to present a negative test. They're going to they're going to be um, required to self quarantine, not at their homes, but at a hotel, at their own expense. These are the same. These are the times that we live in. Right? So expect so some experiences. Quarantine back in the UK at their own expense. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Well, that says a lot. But this is where we are now. And that, yeah, so for you who are asking, that's how I feel about it. And just to leave the UK alone for a little bit in Barbados, let's move over to the US because, I mean, so much was happening there in these past. How long were we on break? Three weeks? 
Um, by now, most of you know that Trump inspired a march to stop the steal. <laughs> <laughs> the Paris. A march or a <laughs> insurrection? An insurrection. <laughs> or stop the steel tariffs on the U.S. Capitol um, in an attempt to stop the state from confirming Biden as the president-elect. Um, suffice to say, it failed, as we know. Um, and Trump has earned this, the distinction of becoming the first U.S. president to be impeached mm -hmm. twice. What's, that, what's it called again? That, um, that um, it's a, a press thing when they do the comedy and stuff with the US. The wait, host correspondence. Um, right, so I host correspondence dinner. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, I remember, I think I remember um, Trump saying that at the White House correspondence dinner when um, Obama was roasting him unmercifully. <laughs> that was the point that he decided that he would run for president. And I mean, he must rule that day <laughs> right now <laughs> i don't think a president has ever left office with a worse record i mean um having i, I have i haven't lost so much i mean he's lost so much in the space of, in the in the last few weeks and i mean he's he's basically embarrassed the u.s so people are just abandoning him right now um it's being said that he's isolated and he's angry and um, we know that um <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. We know that two banks right now have um, pulled uh, their business. They're not doing business with them anymore. Um, I mean, he, he, he almost didn't have somewhere to live because he can't live at Mar a Lago. The <laughs> clause built into his contract. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Everybody is just um, resigning from their jobs. Um, and, you know, he's angry at everyone. He's angry at Pence because. Pence couldn't get him the presidency again. I, I, I'm at a loss at, as to what Pence was actually supposed to do. He was if supposed he had to stop the steal. Right? <laughs> 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 and, and not to mention <laughs> my good boy, the Dai King, Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> who's Trump's long-term lawyer and friend. Um, Giuliani lost um, about 100 lawsuits filed to, over, to overturn the electoral results. So much winning, so much winning. <laughs> so much winning. <laughs> Absolutely crazy, right? I am glad you put that up because um, Giuliani is now saying, Giuliani was charging Trump $20,000 a day, right? And um, Trump is saying that he's not going to pay that fee since Giuliani lost the lawsuits. I mean, somebody needs to tell Trump that that's not how it works. But you pay your lawyer for representing you. You don't pay your lawyer for winning or losing. No. That's so crazy. <laughs> but, there's, you know, I, uh, uh, there's no honor among thieves right. or charlatans. Exactly. I'm, I'm trying, not, I'm trying to, to feel sorry for grifters grifting each other. I, I don't know how that works. <laughs> no, you shouldn't feel sorry for him. <laughs> but anyway, I guess we look forward to... A somewhat normal diplomacy returning to international political landscape. Um, oh, and before you go, Iran is also, um, they currently ha 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 have a, a warrant out for Trump's arrest for killing Kassam Soleimani. Yeah, Soleimani. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. Like, I've never seen a president win so much from behind. <laughs> it so much I try not to laugh at it, but it is what it is. And on that note, here ends this week's hot topic. Viewers, please note that you can also ask questions or contribute to the program with your comments. Simply type them in the comment section below. WhatsApp us on 833-9886 or email us at jpourworldview at gmail.com. Um, thank you, Mary. I see you watching. If you can, please share this video on my personal page. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I have to figure out what was turned off inside to um, that's preventing me from sharing. And also keep sharing this live, liking our page as we attempt to grow as organically as possible. Mm -hmm. You guys have been great so far at, at helping us to build this platform, and we appreciate your help and your support. Um, I also want to tell you that um, at the end of this program, you will get an opportunity to win. 
um, some 2021 death cards, uh, compliments of Signia. They were presented to my son, who's a swimmer, and they feature a number of outstanding Barbadians doing great things. Um, and my son wanted to share some of them with you guys. So I am going to be giving away a few after this show and also after the other show. But you have to absolutely watch the show because I will ask a question coming out of what transpires on the show. And there you have it. Um, Terry cut off my son so you can't see him. But yeah, that's about it. There's a number of Barbadians on there who are doing some wonderful things. <laughs> so now on to our main program. Um, Terry is going to introduce our guest to you today and we look forward to a very interesting program. Hey, Dr. Marshall. Hey, greetings. Greetings hey, to you and to all listeners and viewers. Welcome, Dr. Marshall. Welcome. Thank you Welcome. very much, Ayo and Terry. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Don Marshall is a director and senior research fellow of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of, of Social and Economic Studies at the University of Western East Cape Hill campus. He holds a PhD in international political economy and is the author slash editor of three books, eight monographs, and several scholarly articles in esteemed journals. Dr. Marshall sits on the editorial board of key international journals, such as the University of Helsinki's Globalizations, University of London's Progress in De Development Studies, and University of the West Indies Journal of Eastern Caribbean Studies. His research interests are linked to issues around globalization and development. So welcome again to the show, Dr. Marshall. Happy Thank to have you. you here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again for being here. So we thought that with everything happening right now around the world, with the pandemic, the decimation of our main economic driver, tourism, um, by the global pandemic, which has exposed how vulnerable we are as a small island developing state, that this discussion was timely and that it would be wise or good really to have someone like you on to have this chat with us. Most of us have been aware for some time that we are really too dependent on tourism and uh, we've always read it this day really. Um, the day when tourism basically bellies up and uh, catches us napping prepared and without a diverse economy to sustain us. Well, we're here now. And um, as an eternal optimist, however, I, I never feel as though it's too late to get something right. And I don't expect it to be easy, but I believe that we owe it to our future generations to, to build a better and more resilient economy. So that's what today's show is about in a nutshell, Dr. Marshall. Um, yes. Right. So my first question to you is um, based on a recent article um, with, I think it was with Barbados Today, yeah, um, where it was reported that you said, and I quote, we cannot postpone the question of diversification of the economy and the government sooner rather than later has to sit down and tweak its industrial policy and in tweaking it, they will have to reorient what, it, what, is it, what it is doing with available money. 200 million earmarks for construction projects around the tourism model that is crashing around us with the collapse of the airline industry is something that I think has to be resolved. End of quote. So, do you want to expand a little bit on this? Can we talk about this for a minute? Sure, sure, Ayo and Terry. Uh, again, thank you for having me on, and it's a timely discussion. I was enjoying the discussion and banter between you two, so um, I get a sense that the viewers doesn't want a heavy dose of um, wooden uh, jargon or anything that is drawn necessarily from the vocabulary of the disciplines with which um, yourselves and myself is, is trained because I, I happen to know both of you beyond uh, the role that you're playing as host. So, okay, so let's, let's, um, let's get to the, to the uh, gist of it. All right. You're right, and uh, the quote that you just uh, gave, the quotation that um, was drawn from an interview I, I gave a journalist, is uh, ready to speak to the nature of the crisis that we immediately face uh, relative to the sustaining the tourism development model that we've grown long accustomed to. Mm -hmm. 
so that uh, I mean, every day you're hearing news that uh, affirms that the recovery of the tourism of tourism as we know it uh, up to pre-COVID levels is not likely to occur very soon. I mean, we have to. We are, if we think optimistically, as you were alluding uh, to a time when we can see a rebounding of tourism, which is a, one of the major. Um, one of the major sectors in, in Barbados and Caribbean economies, we'll probably be, say, eight months into a vaccine rollout, uh, cessation of any new strains that might upend what you're vaccinated against. Again, I'm speaking here as a non-expert, non-medical expert. I don't know if the, the, the vaccines themselves um, inhere immunity from all other strains of the COVID, but um, let's assume that in terms of timelines, we are really looking at uh, at best, say eight to 10 months of sustained recovery, uh, health recovery that is around the world, particularly our source markets and other markets that we ought to target. Uh, so that puts us at the winter season of 2021, December 1, approximately. Uh, okay, so Bar Barbados and other Caribbean countries have got to survive between now and December 1. So for the first time in our history, certainly for the first time since attaining independence, we are coming face to face with the limited diversification model that we've grown long accustomed to and indeed wedded to. So when I said we need to tweak industrial policy, I really was being polite. We need to fashion an industrial policy. Um, the industrial policy up until the the crash, and I, if I could call the pandemic the crash, uh, up to that moment has been based on the promotion of holiday resorting services, uh, offshore international financial services, uh, and Trinidad and Tobago and so on. They have mineral exports that can, they can rely on. Uh, other countries rely on some degree of raw materials exports, spices, uh, and uh, some finished products, rum, some manufacturing, and so on. But in the in Barbados in its, it, of itself, and similar countries uh, that were heaviest reliant on tourism, there was a much by way of a robust agricultural and food security policy. Nothing much by way of development of our biotechnology potential, and uh, nothing by way of revaluing culture, the arts, indeed the orange economy, what we talk about. So it's what's fortuitous for us is that in the wake, after 10 years of, global, of a global recession, the years between say 2017 to 2020, there's been, you've had reports coming from universities, university scholars, uh, Caribbean Development Bank, various central bank personnel, research personnel, and um, those that uh, look after the, the deaths of Caribbean countries that sit in international financial institutions. There have been some discussion around exploring our oceans, you know, that we are small islands with big oceans and therefore we should exploit our mar mar maritime economy potential. And there have been some discussion about the biotechnology potential, that is to say, the flora and fauna that we have, you know, you need research in, in those plants, in, in our environments, in the biomass of the country, and so on, in order to create conditions where we could begin to replace um, our energy dependency, uh, or reduce our independent energy dependency by way of creating alternative energy models. And then, of course, tacked onto that is the notion of exploiting our potential with solar technology. So there has been this talk around these possible new niches to which one could fashion an appropriate industrial policy and so on. Now, I have been, uh, the nature of my research is such that in, I'm immersed in those kinds of debates. And those international development debates about the way forward uh, left two major challenges or two issues left, two, two issues are unresolved. One, should we rely on global market forces to drive the diversification of our economies? That is to say that our governments 
uh, act in ways to facilitate uh, new business, encourage foreign investors to come to our shores uh, to take advantage of the productive potentials of our society, societies and economies? Should we leave it to, to you know, foreign investors, the international capital to champion this industrial transformation? And, and then therefore the role of the state is to pursue financial sector enhancement or everything that is required to reduce red tape to, to starting up businesses and so on. Should that be the role of the state? Uh, that's one question that uh, is often asked. And then the second question that is, is also begged is the question of financing for development. To whom should we turn to finance it for development when we, some of our countries are graduated to middle income status, middle income country status, you know? Uh, do we rely then on uh, pursuing an investment grade and then therefore going on capital markets to borrow money? To do so, should we rely on the getting monies from the IMF to assist in infrastructure development and so on? Should we turn to credit to nations? So those are two major issues upon which we need some resolution. One, what ought to be the state posture in relation to recovery from the global recession, now made worse by the fact that a pandemic uh, has, as it were, foreshortened the time span that we would have otherwise need, needed to gradually make that transition. Now we have to make giant leaps, and you don't make giant leaps through a series of small steps. We, right now we need to make a giant leap across from the model of development that we have towards re reconstructing everything that we have. So if it is tourism, we have to look past North America and Britain as our major source markets. And it has to be now. The question I would like to ask uh, tourism ministers around the region is what have you been doing and what have you done to capitalize on those bilateral talks with other markets in Africa, parts of Africa, uh, Latin America, Asia, in relation to attracting new tourists, attracting new airlift and so on and so forth. Because if you're planning for a future in tourism, it has to be much more diversified and robust than the current model that we have. So it's about, it's about making good on those earlier discussions that was taking place in the last five years or embarking on such a, 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 an aggressive policy now. Um, and we know like, we, could, we could list the airlines coming out of Africa that can do the transatlantic voyage, um, the transatlantic flights. You know, what new open air flight agreements are we signing and so on? These are the questions I would like to ask tourism ministers and not necessarily about cruise ships and all kinds of things that um, right now you're, we are operating in a different we have to operate as if we're in a different paradigm, a different moment in time. Uh, and then to talk about diversification across all sectors, it is, um, do we, are we gonna continue as island by islands, engage in bargains with China and other creditor nations? Or are we gonna do so through combinations of regional um, bargaining together with state bargaining? Are we going to, and what is it that we are going to be bargaining for? What is it that we are going into those bargains seeking to get? Uh, are, are the islands that are engaging with China prepared to uh, simply uh, ask China for uh, grant funding and to also access its um, cheap loans for infrastructure, for infrastructure that may or may not transform the economy. What is it, what is it we are doing in, ter in terms of leveraging China for, uh, if we are going to so do uh, away from just heavy reliance on the IMF and, and similar type organizations? Uh, I don't want to leap ahead of myself, but I'm just giving a snapshot of some of the troubling issues and policies that we have to adopt to tackle the way forward and the way forward has to be ensconced within some kind of philosophy of where you want the societies and economies to go. And we are back to perhaps it's history in reverse. We are back to that point where we were engaged, where we were engaging in nation building right after 
political independence, where we had to map and fashion a new way forward, but most governments continued to engage in, exist, in pre-existing colonial patterns of engagement with Britain and its um, uh, allies. And we kept more or less, we could, we, we opted that softer option to go for that soft, softer option rather than uh, undertake a radical transformation of our relationships with the world and with our, the nature of our domestic economies. I think we are back to that point right now, 50 odd years later in the region. And it behooves not just the government, but we in civil society and across various institutions to enjoin in a conversation about the way forward. Um, I think I agree with a lot of what you said, and it reminds me of, so just share here your, um, your book, Car Car Caribbean um, Political Economy at the Crossroads, written a number of years ago now, where I, I guess you outlined, um, on, you made these similar points that you, that you just hit on, right, with regards to the fact that um, the Caribbean really should be orienting itself towards maybe more export-led growth and maybe should deepen regional integration in that regard and so on and so forth. And in light of the impact of COVID on tourism and later the impact of um, blacklisting on Barbados, I know you have some work, you've done a lot, a lot of work actually on the role of the offshore financial centers and Barbados um, as an offshore financial center and the, 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 the narrative that the West has in condemning us well, um, upholding places like London and New York, where most of the terrorist financing and, um, and money laundering actually takes place, as we all know, right? So I uh, just want to um, ask you a question as it relates to your thoughts on the prospect of um, trade being one of the avenues that we could pursue as we go towards this more export-led growth. We know that we don't have the economies of scale of scope in these small territories that we have, um, what role can trade play in this regard? I mean, in, in this book, you point to NAFTA, uh, which Trump has quite recently renegotiated, kind of renegotiated. What, what role can trade play in the context of NAFTA and the broader context? You spoke to Africa, you spoke to you know, the, the South America, you spoke to different parts of the world. What role can, can trade? We know that we're not necessarily going to be great producers um, unless we really specialize in boutique type products. What role can, can trade play for us? Right. So thanks for reminding me of those things I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you raise a very interesting question. And normally to, treat, to get to trade, I normally go through industrial policy. In other words, trade tied to development. So yes, we must be export oriented, but we need an industrial policy that would give rise to that kind of pursuit, not just to to, for the purposes of export, but how do we engage in import replacement? So if I take three things, food, fuel, and medicine. Mm -hmm. If I take those three things as priorities, number one, two, number one, okay? Meaning that most of the region, if you go around, you look at their, the, the heaviest import bills, the, 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 the the very products that um, are the very imports that impact heaviest on our foreign exchange mm -hmm. in the purchase of food, fuel, and medicine. The question is, how do we dynamize and interest local investors as well as foreign investors, local entrepreneurs as well as foreign entrepreneurs, and foreign includes regional and mm -hmm. diaspora connections, of course, to assist in the drive to engage in import replacement of some of these things. So one of the things that we need to do is to uh, pursue an aggressive policy towards food security because we need to reduce that import, that the importation of foods, the way in which we so do. And if, if you take the case of Barbados, uh, we are extremely exposed in that regard. Mm -hmm. We don't have a food security policy worthy of discussion. Um, we, it, in the area of um, fuel, we, we do produce some fuel, and that's refined in Trinidad and Tobago, and that's fine. But alternative energy, given the expiring fossil fuel uh, base type uh, and, and the need for its replacement, we need to find alternative sources of energy. And um, while that's continued in Barbados, 
we still need, we, we haven't seen the emergence of a new economic class of, of producers of um, alternative energy sufficient to influence policy in that requ in the required direction. Uh, and, and, and also in the area of um, medicines, we need to attract as much research and development as possible to help us to realize that potential. Now, in fashion and industrial policy that looks primarily at import replacement as a first step, mm -hmm. it means that what the things that we export and the route towards exporting in those other areas will turn on the question of whether we are going to enjoy our Caribbean sisters and brothers in the, produ in the production of some of these very products. And where we can find niches as small island states, we should so pursue. Mm -hmm. um, but the challenge in, 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 in um, exports really comes from the fact that we have a very conservative enterprise culture. We have a banking system and lending at the level of the state is very, very, very conservative. And I'm, I'm putting that mildly. Mm -hmm. um, most persons, uh, first it starts out as a sociological problem and economists often miss this. Entrepreneurship is at first in the Caribbean a sociological problem mm -hmm. for which the state has to intervene to correct. It is a sociological problem because we do not have a long run history of black middle class development in the region. Mm -hmm. The middle class first, the black and brown middle class emerged in the Caribbean after 1940. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you don't have the intergenerational wealth available across families, middle class families, to throw behind ideas, to throw behind projects. So they have to as it were, entrepreneurs, black and brown entrepreneurs in our parts have to rely on the banks, angel investors, philanthropers, and, um, and their wits, really, to pursue uh, uh, risky enterprise. And when they pursue risky enterprise, culturally, failure is not embraced. Mm -hmm. To have failed once is to fail forever. So you have these entrepreneurs who've tried and failed, and today they're walking nihilisms. They're, in, they're, they're desperate to prove to persons that they're worthy individuals to whom that you, through whom you can invest an idea with. Mm -hmm. But unlike, say, other producer nations in Asia, Europe, parts of Africa, um, where failure is embraced as part of the DNA of any entrepreneur, we have a situation where they're made pariahs in our societies, not just Barbados, but throughout the region. Uh, show me a person that's failed spectacularly in business, and I'll show you someone who's experiencing social death or rejection. So um, this is where the state needs to continue the business left behind the decolonization. There's some unfinished business. And giving rise to a new economic class ought to be priority number one in this post-COVID moment. And that is to say, you must look at those individuals or those cooperatives or those sectors with potential and fund them, mobilize capital in those directions uh, in order to stimulate the rise of entrepreneurship in those areas. And um, I'm afraid to say, that, I mean, I'm not going to be afraid to say this. Where we have the strengths, say, in the production of food, uh, in production of beverages, rum, and so on. We need to be adding more value to those. So the rum we sell in Barbados, world class, etc., ought to be blended with fruits of the Caribbean, or fruits that we can grow in our in our spaces: gooseberries, June plum, golden apple. You know, they have, they, we ought to be selling alcohol blends, alcoholic blends, that marry the tropical produce that we produce in our parts with the reputation of our rooms mm -hmm. and create new kinds of products. So we need a value added impetus to already existing industry in the region. And there are one or two notable areas of industry um, that the Caribbean is known for. It's just about adding greater value to them. 
and, and societies embracing the idea that tax dollars may have to be spent in that direction mm -hmm. to give rise to those kinds of value-added uh, improvements. Uh, right now, as it stands, the only thing that Caribbean people seem to, Caribbean taxpayers seem to respond to with enthusiasm is the constant spend of their tax dollars in the drive towards boosting tourism as industry. But if you try to, drive, to put that tax dollars to drive industrial development proper, you're going to hear all kinds of ideological crap trap about let the market decide who the winners and losers. Uh, we don't want our taxpayers' money spent. This is not a socialist place. And all kinds of isms and schisms, we can, all we need to do is to accept the fact that the state has to play a kind of a starring role in any diversification attempts. And now in this moment when the IMF is saying to the rest of the world, you've got to spend your way out of this crisis. You've got to engage in forms of what they, the terminology they use is deficit spending. Yeah, Keynesianism is back. Yeah, Keynesianism is back, engaging deficit spending. Never mind Barbados has, Barbados's policy advisors has wrongly advised its prime ministers to stick within a 1% deficit, which is a very restrictive fiscal space within which our ambitious prime minister is expected to maneuver. Um, the reality is that we need considerable elbow room to spend tax dollars in the direction of giving rise to new sectors. Mm -hmm. And that also includes arts and culture. I'm big on that. To revalue the arts and culture of the region mm -hmm. is to give is to answer identity issues, and is to give, uh, uh, it's also to raise indigenous knowledges and indigenous crea creativity in ways that will release, again, more entrepreneurial spirits, talents, and drives. And, and a country that is gonna pay attention to its arts and culture is a culture, is a country that will see innovation we'll see creativity explored in tremendous ways. There's tremendous value added. Mm -hmm. And we have got it all wrong, saying we need to target money towards uh, STEM and so on, forgetting that ultimately you've got to build pride, hope, identity, and other soft mental attributes as a prerequisite to enthusing persons to say, I will go into the STEM subjects because I think I can make a difference in a Barbados or in the Caribbean uh, region uh, because I know my, my skills and talents will be valued and so on and so forth. As opposed, and, and also to encourage the brightest and the best to say, I will, if I'm not inclined to do STEM and I'm inclined to be engaged in musical arrangements, I can find creative expression and monetize returns for making such an educational investment and so on. But there's so much more I can say, but I have to be careful not to. <laughs> yeah, but I guess, yeah, I mean, you're right. It does require, if you're gonna reorient the, the economy towards culture and towards the export of our cultural products, along with the other products that we do have, then it will require some state intervention. I think, particularly at this point in time, and I just want to get your take on, and I'll let I, always, I think I has a couple questions, have a couple questions to ask in this regard at all. Um, don't you think one of the main issues that we are facing is one of original original design for our economies? Like this, our economies are set. I mean, you spoke to the conservative. I think you're being very generous. Nature of the banks. Um, some people would say, well, I'm not going to say. Um, some people would say other other words, right, to describe the nature of our banks and, and the banking system historically in Barbados, right, and even up to this present this present point in time. Um, Barbados is set up historically as a, an expansive type of economy, one where you know we had Barbados was a slave colony, right, one where a particular set of segment of the population essentially extracted wealth from another segment of the population, and don't you think that I mean we are long well, we're away from that now, but don't you think that some of the issues that we're facing, particularly with the, um, the entrepreneurial class that you spoke to before, speaks to that same type of um, original, extractive type base um, economic system in Barbados, whereby entrepreneurs, Black entrepreneurs in Barbados, are not necessarily 
encouraged to engage in business right, um, while they're encouraged to consume and thereby by consuming support other elements in society. Yes, very much so. Um, I promise not to use jargon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you, know our, you know our already just say <laughs> you know you know there's this thing about the predominance of buying and selling and um and the emphasis on commerce over production all these are features of what we call the legacy of merchant capital so let me explain just briefly um the colonial the slavery colonial experience has been marked by features of industrial capital in the form of the production of sugar from the sugar cane and merchant capital meaning the uh, predominance of the offering of credit import trading and other forms of real estate prospecting most of our economies today what has been the legacy of that Mm -hmm. is that some of our economies, particular part, and Barbados is a paradigmatic example of that. It's an economy that is reflected in, you know, most capital accumulation or most wealth accumulation is extracted from the following activities, finance, import trading, insurance, and real estate prospecting. So in my lectures abroad and here in the region, I speak about the trap of fire, F-I-R-E, meaning finance, insurance, um, import trading, so there's two I's, and real estate prospecting. Those are the areas to which greater lump, great lumps of profit or great lumps of accumulation are acquired. Those are the areas seen as safe business. Those are the areas where um, you know, outside of the professions, we advise our children to get involved in anytime they say they want to do business. We make sure they fit within one of those kinds of um, uh, 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 features, one of those types of, uh, th th one of those ways in which one can earn money. And we sort of valorize the ease of commerce over the challenge of industry. So, that's best uh, um, recognized when you see we as a region, particularly in Barbados, again, we value the foreign brand over the local equivalent. And we make fun of local industry while always presuming uh, the foreign good as innately superior and so on. So all this is a legacy of merchant capital and part of uh, overcoming Part of overcoming coloniality or overcoming the blight of merchant capital is to uh, encourage, uh, you know, the or culturally raise uh, the awareness around producers in our midst. So we have every year we have across the region the production of music forms. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, when we are looking for examples of fine entrepreneurs they ought to be taking sort of center stage. I mean, you look at your national heroes and so on, named in, in, across different countries, and you may have freedom fighters, and that's fine, great. Um, but then you, there are no captains of industry, really, in that listing, in those listings. You know, other cultures speak of their Rockefellers and others, their Bill Gates and so on. We don't have captains of industry. We have captains of commerce. Mm -hmm. So when you have one or two rare individuals like... Um, the late, the recently passed and late, but Stuart, the reason why he's spoken about in such glowing terms and we, and we should embrace that is to, to do with the fact that, you know, his business interests range across the production to the services side of things. I think at one point he ran airlines and so on. Um, here was a guy willing to take risks and here was a guy willing to tackle, you know, how we how we um, should express ourselves as entrepreneurs. And the sad irony is that the Caribbean is littered with a history of very enterprising individuals, mm -hmm. very enterprising individuals, right? When we think of the ways in which we, we made cups, we made um, food for sale, we made 
uh, a number of things, appliances and so on, to sustain our lives and to bring a bit of, uh, introduce some amenities to, to our way of living and so on. You know, it's a pity that we don't celebrate the, the uh, you know, persons who are known for their inventions and their product making. We, we sort of treat them as um, kind of, uh, you know, you know, we just ignore them really. Um, so we need a cultural shift in that regard. I will, I will want to say though that um, even as we speak about the need for to embrace uh, industry uh, and, and production and inventiveness, there is a need for, I think, a return to this idea of uh, promoting promoting scientific in, in endeavor and innovation. And it could be in any, in any, um, any uh, in any initiatives. So that I would wish to see, it used to happen in Barbados, but I would wish to see a return to national innovation competitions in schools, mm -hmm. uh, in primary and secondary schools. I would also want to see uh, in primary schools, the idea of industrial arts being taught from early, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So there, there needs there needs for a change in education and so on. But uh, again, we could go on on, on these matters. Um, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Go, go, go ahead, Ayo. Right. I, I was going to ask you about the role that regionalism can play um, right now in this time. How how best should we as a nation move forward embracing it? Um, um, you know, to help us to get us past where we are right now, not just us, but the region in general. Um, but I also want to touch a little bit on something else that con that kind of concerns me sometimes. Like, isn't it time that we start to negotiate um, with powers that be for for, to get certain things done for younger people in Barbados with regard to e-commerce. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about being able to make money by YouTube, be it, um, social networks and so forth in the way that 10 and 12 year olds in other countries can. I know that we are a small island and that goes against us because of the numbers. Um, but I also think that it's a little bit more than that. We're basically locked out of the international economic <laughs> um, market. Basically, it's very hard to receive money in Barbados, and I've tried numerous yeah. times. It's extremely hard to receive money in Barbados for reasons that are unknown. Um, I know that we have the, the concern of foreign exchange, but every country has that. Uh, I feel like it's something that we really have to mitigate um, because I think that it, what we're doing is a disservice to ourselves. And I do not think that the people who are at the levels that they are at, I think that there's a disconnect um, between what is actually possible and what they see. The multimillionaires who have become multimillionaires, it's not a computer, literally with one or two products or just a service or something. and. Uh, is is virtually impossible in Barbados. And you're, and you're right, Ayo, because it, it actually links back to what Don was saying before with regards to culture as well, in that the easiest way to sell a lot of these cultural products is by having a YouTube channel, by having a Patreon account. And it's very difficult in Barbados to be able to monetize these things. I think Ayo says, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen in Barbados. And in yeah. fact, what it would encourage the individual to do is basically Barbados is easy to leave, or to set up an account overseas, overseas to receive the money and to, and, to hold, and to hold the money offshore to Barbados, right? So it's, it's not as, um, I don't understand why these things that exist with regards to- Amazon marketplace, things like um, the number of other marketplaces now. And I mean, we are literally locked out of that market by virtue of our geographic location. Yes, the digital platform has become the new value for, or I would say the, the new uh, platform of value, of creating value. Mm -hmm. So if we can compare, uh, if we can look at the leading countries in the world, probably China in this regard, um, 
you know, they create many platforms for, I know, I know we, we have the PayPal and so on, you have Alibaba and these other platforms to facilitate commerce, mm -hmm. right? And there's a way in which we need to be able to embrace uh, the fact that we are into a digital marketplace uh, to sell our wares, our products of the mind and so on, and, and have, I have easy access to monetizing such without having to, as you say, you know, go through that, go through um, hoops or to return to traditional ways in which you can monetize sales overseas, sales of products and services overseas. Uh, we don't necessarily always need to establish chapters of our service overseas for a middle individual to collect and then send to us. There's a way in which we should be able to right here create uh, let's say a software game and sell it from our shores right here or sell a service in relation to, to these areas from our shores uh, as you sorry not cross me but let's go on. let me just give you an example there are there's a I think he's like seven or eight years old child online on um, YouTube and what he does is he, he companies sell, send a toy to him and he reviews that toy. He plays with it and he just talks to other seven-year-olds who log into his, his channel and he's a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I'm so serious. I'm not even joking. Which like, country are you from? The little boy. The US, of course. I think he's in the US that he is. I, I'm not even sure which country it is. No, because I have a 10-year-old. My 10-year-old <laughs> son. He logs in and he plays games with people all over the world. He was showing me some, um, I can't remember what it's called, a platform, some type of platform that he has. Tell me about it, Terry. What's it called? Um, Discord. A Discord server. Discord server. Something that he has that uh, I, I don't even know because I'm young too, but that is like beyond the long. Yeah, Discord. <laughs> yeah. And he set up this platform and he's teaching people how to speak um, a dialect. This is my son. Now, other people who are doing this in other parts of the world, they're making money from it. My son can't because of his geographic location. So there's this disadvantage to our young people that they're experiencing right now. And I think that right now is a good time for us to start to really look at this because this world is going on and leaving us behind. It's true. Well, I mean, we do have some good examples. Like, so we have DJ Puffy. So I subscribe to him. Yes, yeah, yeah. I subscribe to him on YouTube. So he has he's able to monetize. I'm not sure how he's how he's, how he's doing it, but you have a manager overseas doing it. There you go, right? So I, I mean, I have no idea, but I mean, it is it is we are inhibited still because in in where I say in UK, I could I can do this tomorrow, but if we go to but when I go to Barbados, I can't I can't get this done. I can set up. I can set up an Amazon store very easily. Barbados is, is very difficult. You have to jump through a whole lot of hoops. In fact, you, you can't set up an Amazon store in Barbados. Um, it goes back to the, the point of the gatekeepers and culture. Right. The gatekeepers that are responsible for uh, these hoops, these barriers, these rules that are applied to a bygone era, and and the insistence on enforcing such, they are splendidly unaware and ignorant. Right. And it and it comes from also this innate sense of knowing all and uh, believing that, you know, that this is the way it has to be done and we have to be careful about this and that. And uh, look, there, there's a sense in which the two things we have to guard against. One, this idea that the, going the digital route is a silver bullet to our economic wars. Mm -hmm. that yeah. There is that coming down through the pike in, the, in international development circles. Oh, you need to digitize your economies. If you digitize your economies, watch, watch its transformative potential on society. You have to be careful with that because it's important to recognize that, I don't want to overstate the point, but culture makes a difference. Hmm. That's what motivates a 10 year old to tell himself that I can do this and then know he has an enabling cultural and institutional environment that allow him at 10 mm -hmm. uh, with his parents or guardians to become millionaires, mm -hmm. you know, um, from the activity. Um, we have DJ Puffy, not now, this is three, four years DJ Puffy mm -hmm. has been 
a, an excellent cultural export ambassador. We have never called him in for a simple interview on our terrestrial radio, I'm sorry, it's our terrestrial television, or anywhere in the radio stations. We are just caught up with his music and the fact that he can play. How at 26 he can be about by now? Because he started playing for fame around 21, 22. But he, let's see he's in his mid-20s. And he's leading a productive, successful life. Mm -hmm. And we have not, not once in our newspapers have been zeroed in on this successful individual. Why? Because we are unable to culturally see. Mm -hmm. But a certain individual says he wants to import as much photovoltaic panels as possible and sell them to the grid that makes for front page because that's seen as some great entrepreneurial idea when it's just buying an easy buying easy assembly or reproduction of and, and the production of um of uh, or the harvesting of energy for sale to the national grid it's not rocket science really but that makes that makes um national conversation and so on and uh, you know we there are so many other DJ puppies out there. There's so many artists in the region too that we can we can ask how they're surviving, how they're coping. You look at Masha Montana, what he represents, you know, in terms of excellence. Um uh well Rihanna is on a different scale altogether. Oh, but the oh. point I'm making <laughs> right, the point I'm making is that in this COVID moment, a number of these artists have had to find innovative ways to sustain their livelihoods. Where are the stories about them? I want you know. to ask a question from the audience. That's, that's true. Um, I'll start with Sanyata. And I'm going to we have to get back to that regional point that you wanted to raise. And that's pretty cool, but we'll do something later. Yes. Um, that's okay. Sanyata is asking, I wanted to hear the guest's view about, views about productivity in Barbados and why the Caribbean, and also, how do we face those challenges, these challenges with the reality of climate change threatening to literally um, destroy us? I'm happy about, I'm happy to receive that question. Mm -hmm. uh, yet I know we started the program by focusing on basically two of the crises, meaning um, the Great Recession and the COVID pandemic. But there are a series of what we call interacting and converging crises of which climate change is one. So that real existential threat forces us to not just focus on the need for um, what I would want to um, say to be the need to produce. Or we should move beyond just the goal, the aspirational goal of equitable distribution of social and economic well-being. Okay, or advancing human dignity. And I'm very much um, a champion of that um, as part of the expression of what decolonization in the Caribbean should mean, you know, the advance of human dignity through the equitable distribution of social and economic well-being. Um, but we must also look at the question of sustainability because whatever we do in our social economic and cultural policies must be in harmony with the biosphere, must be in harmony with how we treat to the environment, and must be in harmony with how we engage in new bargains in the international political economy. And one such bargain is the bargain for um, climate mitigation insurance, climate mitigation support, climate change mitigation support, and so on. Uh, our prime minister, and one or two other prime ministers in the region have been known, and their missions have been known to advance this agenda, but is this a concerted Caribbean-wide action? Are we looking for coalitions of the willing uh, with other small island regions that too are at the front lines of climate change? What role is the Caribbean, our Caribbean leaders carry complain in engendering a coalition of support around these very. Sorry, Don, um, you need to unmute yourself again. Sorry, what, what role 
is CARICOM playing in engendering coalitions of support in favor of climate change mitigation relief, mitigation funds, and so on and so forth. And right now, one or two prime ministers are doing it. One or two missions are, are involved in advancing this cause, but we really we need uh, a regional approach towards this. And this is just one of those many, many, many bargains that we have to engage as a region as we do trade. And as we, well, in the new dispensation, uh, as we renew trade agreements, we have to insist on them being trade plus and for, a plus for us is not just development, but an end to the harassment of what we do legitimately through our international financial centers. We have to tap this thing onto our trade missions, uh, a part of their mandate. We cannot continue to treat to the blacklisting of our countries as a separate issue away from trade and away from development. This is bread and butter. This is, an, this is a threat to an economic sector that emerged out of its own uh, legacy, historical legacy, a long tradition with merchant capital predilections or long uh, merchant capital specializations. The fiduciary knowledges that we bring to bear in the international financial se sector are fiduciary knowledges that were in place and has been part of our legacy from the time of the plantation. When those plantations went in, became indebted after slavery ended, they fell into the hands of merchant capital banks and institutions and houses that had the fiduciary or what we call the knowledge of accounting, banking, and so on to, to sustain them. Uh, and, and sometimes we have to speak back to empire by saying to them, one, our legacy of offshore financial um, services does not begin with the creation of the euro dollar market in 1958 as your history books and your textbooks preach. They begin with the running of the plantations, the bookkeeping that was associated with them and the institutions that were formed coming out of slavery to keep them afloat and to keep credit lines afloat. So you have institutions like the Barbados Mutual Life that started in 1840. That's known today as Sajikor. You have something called a Nassau Sponge Index, which was a floor for trading on prices on, the, on, on sponges that, that comes from the sea. You have a long history going back into colonial times of these different islands functioning as um, uh, finance warehouses, uh, warehousing, they warehouse cargo of all kinds. Uh, a history of Nassau tells you that, a history of Cayman Islands tells you that, a history of Bermuda tells you that. And there's no respect for the legacy of these countries, no respect for what they do, no respect for them being progenitors or originators in early modern finance, no respect to the contribution that the Caribbean, therefore, has made to modern finance. And when we teach our students, unfortunately, in our finance departments, when we teach them about portfolio finance theory, we excavate that history. We don't teach it. And that's unfortunate. We don't teach in our indigenous universe of the West Indies how Caribbean countries came to be expert and then today some of the leading financial centers in the world. How is that? It's actually quite interesting that you mentioned that because my former head of department here at Durham he, um, so I'm in the accounting department, and he, this is David Oderoy, and he specializes in the history of accounting with respect to the colonial period, with respect to places like Barbados, with respect to um, right. Jamaica. So that history is known, that history is written about, that history is, that history is actually reflected when David was with us, it's reflected mm -hmm. in the first year accounting uh, module, right? So. It's right. actually quite interest, interesting that you mentioned that. Because so in terms of being taught, but <laughs> over the Caribbean, <laughs> over the West Indies, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the University of the West Indies, so let me first say this, right? Um, we have to break down disciplinary divides that are, are, that are constitutive of departments. So 
we have to break that divide and those barriers and those uh, 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 ceilings and so on, those, those blockages, because we have to accept that history cult, and culture really are master disciplines. Mm -hmm. And this infuse how we teach, what we teach, sorry, the content, the actual curriculum content has to be infused with history and culture all through it. We have to find ways to uh, make quite clear as we teach in the University of the West Indies, you know, the provenance of Caribbean history and the provenance of our culture and the people and the indigenous knowledges and how this in, 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 in part shape who we are and contributing to global civilization or westernization or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I'm happy that that's happening at, at Durham and I know for a fact that um, I do enjoy going on the speaking circuits in UK, uh, speaking about early modern finance and the role of the Caribbean, uh, just to let them know that, you know, a, a number of the, or just to share, sorry, not let them know, but just to share that much of what they call um, modern finance, uh, you know, modern credit, modern commerce and so on were practices that extended not just to the history of those very countries, but to the history of the colonies so linked to those countries. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's without a doubt. Um, but I just want to, I want to take you back to the point you made um, before about the, um, the role that we played in modern finance and the narrative, the grand narratives that the Europeans, um, the European that's, Union in particular, at this point that, thing. That chapter looks, just looks familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to take you back to this. So you have a chapter in um, diplomacies of small states. Um, yeah. where you point to this. You point. You kind. Of, you point to the, um, the the role that the Caribbean has played and the, the unfair narrative yeah. that the European Union and quite self-serving actually narrative that the European Union, especially, um, is exposing with regards to us and you know, the the blacklisting and so on and so forth. Um, how can we? I guess the question is, how can we um, com combat this grand narrative, particularly given the power dynamic and the power relation between a place like Barbados, which is now blacklisted in a very small country, and the mighty European Union, 400 million people plus, well, minus 50, 50 million um, since, since Brexit, right? What, how, how can we go about com combating this narrative, this grand narrative that has no basis in reality, really? At least, well, if, well, let's play devil's advocate for a second. And let's let's um, let's try to give the arg the argument they're giving um, some credence. Do they have? Do they really have an argument? Is the second part of the question. So, so the question is, um, how can we combat the grand narrative that they're that they're uh, promulgating about us, trying to undermine um, our role in global finance? And secondly, do they do they have a point? If you're if, if we're to take their argument seriously, if we're to um, um, you know, consider their perspective for a moment. Do they have Do they have any point that we that we might want to consider? Okay, their their fundamental concern and our and, and I would say the global concern really is with uh, international financial instability right. in various forms. Mm -hmm. So you have international financial instability represented by um, the th money laundering threats, right? represented by uh, the, the role that terrorist financing plays in sponsoring terrorism around the world. And, uh, and also in the ways in which opaque financial practices across all gamuts of the international financial architecture, you know, all, you know, within the international financial architecture that comprises uh, banks, uh, offshore financial centers like ours and, and, and those in, in the United States and London and so on. Um, they facilitate a number of conducts and a number of um, uh, schemes that are to do with tax minimization, which is entirely legal. However, there's a gray area between tax minimization mm -hmm. and tax evasion. Right. So uh, to put it in a nutshell to the listeners, right. But to, put a, to put it in a nutshell on this score, um, if I set up a business in 
in, uh, let's call it, every sort of business where you are in Durham, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, and, it's, and I'm doing that business, I'm a Barbadian citizen, but I'm conducting business in Durham and, and the profits uh, are plowed back into Barbados and Durham, you know, the two spaces very operate. Um, I would have been aware before I set up the business that there's a double taxation treaty between Barbados and England, right. where the agreement is that the two countries will not tax me sim uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have a tax obligation to meet in Barbados and a tax obligation to meet where I reside with the business or where my business resides. So um, for me, setting up in, in Durham, I would have checked out that. I would have realized that the rates for the tax, the tax regime there for corporation, the corporation tax there is say 1%. Mm -hmm. Whereas here in Barbados up to recently, um, my company would have had to pay anything between 20, 25% and 35%. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would say, look, let me set up my company. Let me register it in Durham. Right. That way, if I followed the laws as applied to the county and the country, I'm only paying 5%, 1%, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to paying 25 That is perfectly legal. That is part and parcel of international tax competition, which again is legal. Mm -hmm. And that, is, that explains how companies and firms have gone global and continue to go global in their reach for greater sales abroad, in their reach to have certain aspects of, a, of their business farmed out to different countries of the world. So, uh, so basically what I'm saying to you then is part of today's demand for price competitiveness among leading firms in the world is that they pursue an international tax competition strategy. And it means you know, engaging in bargains between different locales in order to get the best, in order to reduce the tax contribution it has to make. Good, that's a lot of words. So to get to the heart of what you're saying now, the, the accusation is that Caribbean offshore financial centers and those in the Pacific, like Vanuatu and so on, are engaging in what they call tax evasion, that they're, we are facilitating tax evasion or we are facilitating um, uh, rich people in the West, particularly, from evading and avoiding their tax obligation to their countries. One, that's one accusation. Two, that we are especially susceptible to financial abuses and scandals because we have weak regulatory structures. Big assumption. Three, that our regimes really are permissive and lax. Now, on the idea that we have weak regulations and that we have permissive regimes that allow for slap business or dodgy business, the evidence is thin, very, very thin, but it's a mobilization of a particular kind of stereotype. Yep. And stereotypes don't require evidence, do they? Well, one of our favorite, well, one of my favorite authors. Yes, 2014. Um, in, in this book, Capital, his most recent book, it, I mean, I, I love a lot of what he writes, but it, it seems as though like he's a he is an important thought leader in this right. world. But he has a very narrow. Um, yeah, there's this. It, when, you mean regards, that's justice? Yeah, that's justice. Yeah, there is this. Okay, this is pathological now. Right. Ever since the global recession, and the big fix, the big scandal to do with the collapse of Wall Street, and so on. In the chain of blame, they've listed offshore financial centers as facilitating what a, a, a colleague of mine calls um, um, that we engage in calculated ambiguity. In other words, we, we engage in creative fraud schemes to lure business. Right. Or that we engage in um, tax minimization schemes that are themselves uh, unethical. The problem with that kind of analysis is that Nevada, Colorado, <laughs> London, New York, uh, New York, Vancouver. Montreal, Vancouver, and I can list them, they all have, they all offer the same kinds of services that we do offer while escaping the negative classifications yeah. and the blacklisting. Right. 
right? So London is known as the biggest offshore financial center of them all. They privatize and anonymize money in ways in which we do not. In many ways, they don't respond to the FATCA or to the, I say FATCA, that's a terminology. I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak in acronyms. Mm -hmm. there, there are different uh, programs set up a legislation passed in different countries that particularly say in the United States that demands clarity of, that demands information exchange agreements uh, involving Americans who do business overseas. So if you're gonna do business and it exceeds $10,000, you have to, the city, you have to make the United States Internal Revenue Agency very much aware that that is happening through the production of um, uh, reports. Uh, in another form, it's called Suspicious Activity Reports, or SARS, uh, and so on. But basically, there is a, a, a raft of um, compliance measures that we have to meet to satisfy um, key countries in the OECD grouping and the EU that we are not engaging in facilitating tax evasion. Right. They call harmful tax practices. And London doesn't comply with any of these things. Really. And London is not required to comply. Nevada is not required to comply. I could go on to, to, to this thing, <laughs> right? Colorado, Ohio, um, they're not required to comply. Mm. Yet, yet they offer the same so-called offshore benefits. Yeah. Offshore. So yeah. I, I want to add, I heard I.O. coming in, but I want to wrap up with making one small point. To combat that, which is what you ask, yeah. we have in the past relied on an argument that says, woe is me, you are attacking me unfairly. Where is the evidence to show that I facilitate harmful tax practices or money laundering or terrorist financing? You don't have the evidence, woe is me, where are you blacklisting me? I have from mutual legal assistance treaties down to the latest version of tax information exchange agreements, I've been signing on to. I'm more. I'm up to here in compliance, in the compliance that I sign, the compliance agreements that I sign. Why is it that the latest version of compliance, because I've delayed by a month or two, you're putting me on these black lists and gray lists? That has been our traditional approach uh, to both the OECD country, OECD organization, and the EU. We need to instead, in my view, engage in some of the activity associated with what we call changing norms. We need to advance an argument through our trade agreements and other international um, uh, conferences that the Caribbean represents a flight to quality, hmm. not an escape from one's obligation. You have to turn it around. The reason why after 30, 40 years of negative attacks, about us facilitating shady conducts in our financial services. You ask yourself, what accounts for the resilience of these? What accounts for it is that the market penalizes, the penalize, sorry, the market rewards and affirms those that do good business. Mm -hmm. We continue to attract- Are you the people. same market, market-based arguments? I'm using the market-based argument now as, as, as convenient. Because mm -hmm. I have to, I have to so do because this is the house that Jack built. Right. <laughs> this is the capitalist house that Jack built. Mm -hmm. They say if the market will reward uh, the most efficient and penalize the least efficient. So on, on the market argument, this is a flight to quality. Right. On the evidential, evidentiary um, principle, where is the evidence to support what you're saying? Uh, there, there've been uh, my colleague Rosemary Bell Antoine, Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine, who's done a lot of legal work, pointing out that um, the right to determine one's tax policy is a, is a key sovereignty, fiscal sovereignty right. Mm. She's highlighted even in recent work some landmark decisions made by um, what's it was uh, the court by courts of appeal and uh, in Bahamas, in Bermuda, 
where at every turn, whenever there was a request for information about a particular client, the court ruled that it was that there wasn't enough evidence of a crime enforceability value mm. to facilitate a fishing expedition. Right. So they were telling the United States, you will not exercise extra jurisdictional power over us here in the region unless you can put forward evidence that is more than just a whim. Right. It must have what they call a crime enforceability value. And I use that term because I think lawyers have a way of fashioning way, uh, you know, terminologies that can assist in mobilizing an argument. So we need to be saying to the to United States, well, to the OECD and to the EU, when you are, we have signed all these agreements to facilitate in international cooperation in the fight against money laundering, et cetera, et cetera. Then you approach our shores. When, once you have evidence of a crime enforceability value, we would open our books and allow you to see what you need to be seen. But we were in violation of international law to A, just release the banking information or the financial information of a client without, without um, you know, just cause. And B, at any rate, the, neither the OECD or the EU has a sanction in international law to carry out sanctions against anybody. Only a country can carry out sanctions against another country. Mm. So even the threats are idle uh, and, and are, have no basis in international law. So we have to challenge the OECD, whether it's the Financial Action Task Force or the OECD itself, mm. whether it's um, EU as an entity or any of its constituent bodies, we have to look them squarely in the eye and say, your accusations don't square with international, your threat doesn't square with international law, and we are not moving. Yeah. We're not budging. Yeah, I mean, but I Sorry. agree with that. Yeah, but we have, we have a serious, we have a serious, before you come in, I, we have, but we have a serious, I, I agree that we should try in this way to change the norms of the, and, and the discourse, but we have a serious problem on our hands because when, when we can have very popular, like we have Thomas Piketty, Right, it is most recent, but again, capital ideology. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything in here except for the narrative as it relates to um, the Caribbean's role in um, as a partial financial sector. Not because I am being very nationalistic, you know, I'm from Barbados. I don't want you to criticize my country, my my country right or wrong. That's not that's not what um, that's not how I feel about it. If there was any um, validity in the argument, I would I would consider it. But I, I do find it to be lacking substance, as you said. There's really not much evidence that the, we... Mm. Sorry, sorry to ask you, but that's about the coloniality of knowledge. Going back to my earlier point, if you back it off, if you back it off the role that the Caribbean or other geographies play in modern finance, in the creation of production of modern finance, then you will form assumptions uh, based on ignorance. Right. So completely unaware of the role that the Caribbean has historically played and continues to play in demonstrating uh, regulatory forbearance, blissfully unaware, Thomas Piketty proceeds to take up, ar take up arguments circulating in the Western spaces. And it's very, it's very prominent. It's, it's a very, it's a very it's prominent, it's well funded and yeah. so on. I, I recently, um, there's a tax, tax justice, uh, sorry, there is a uh, let's say tax alert. I can't remember the name of the organization. Yeah, tax justice um, organization. Can't remember the name of it. But um, I've had to object to their to the way in which they proceed to perceive the Caribbean. And when they made the interventions about the role that the Caribbean plays and the ways in which their own knowledge is, treats in parenthesis right. the role that the Caribbean has played historically in uh, providing financial services, when it identified them, they were stunned and they, they were stunned because the stereotypes stick and cling. They've, they've created a reality for themselves and it's self-serving, yeah. It's in Hollywood, you know, if you want to hide your ill-gotten gains, take it to the Caribbean, Yeah, you know? And in a way, when they speak about Switzerland and Austria and Luxembourg, they don't suffer the way we do. 
mm-hmm. because their economies are lots more diversified. Switzerland being a microelectronics producer mm-hmm. uh, in in of it, in and of itself, and and so on. And and but with us, this is bread and butter. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was gonna ask a question, and then I saw um, <laughs> my boy are answering a similar version, but I'm gonna ignore. Uh, art's version of the question. <laughs> you know, art. And if you ain't got the money, art. <laughs> but, Dr. Marshall, what I want to ask you is um, does Barbados really have a, a, a future of a, a financial cent- of a financial services? Offshore financial center mm. um, if the EU is just going to continually move the, go- the goalposts? And that's similar to what um, Art was ask, is asking in the in the comments. Too. I mean, if they if they're moving the goalposts, I just feel like I mean, how it's forty do years do of goalposts being shifted. Exactly. Um, yeah, this is this is a long time. We if we begin with the there is a there was a congressional report known as the Gordon Report that was published in nineteen eighty that talked about Caribbean, the Caribbean and its and uses and abuses of Caribbean tax savings. I think that was the name of the report. And that began a long line of congressional scrutiny of what we do, right up to when, I mean, Obama, um, President Obama and Carl Levin m- made their names as congressmen, um, threatening to shut, threatening, well, saying that, you know, we engage in, in uh, unfair uh, offshore financial practices and that, you know, our, or um, offshore sectors should be, you know, closed off, shut down, and so on and so forth. Um, you asked about the future, but the thing about it is that finance is a peculiar kind of species, right? In, in that ways to service, so I shall explain to viewers that the benefits are not only in tax minimization uh, that is legal, the benefits are in wealth management proper so that if I can, I don't want to call companies names, but if you've got a, you've got some reinsurance companies in Canada, for example, that have long done business with us here. Some have kept their business going because we engage in the hiring. We, do, we, we, we create the contracts for hire, both of staff and of service providers. The, all the administrative and fiduciary work, by that I mean the accounting and other work is done here in Barbados. And that's a cost saving to headquarters in Canada. Um, indeed, there's in, in the economics literature, there's something called capital formation. And they argue that a lot of the capital formation in or that has been created through Barbados has facilitated capital in our companies in uh, Canada to go global. You understand? The whole, in fact, Every time you see the term transnational corporation, scratch the surface a little bit into their biography and you'll find that they have um, allied networks across different financial centers in the world offering what we in Barbados do. And you will find as well that in the listing of leading financial centers in the world, if there's a top 20, about five or seven Caribbean countries are prominent in that listing. So this is a niche that you don't, you don't easily get up and give up and it requires some innovation. Now going forward, given what's happening in the area of biotechnology research, uh, given what's happening in the area of um, pharmaceutical research, medicinal research to do with, with um, uh, vaccines against pathogens and so on and so forth, as these companies seek to grow exponentially, there a number of their headquarter functions, they're going to farm out to offshore financial centers, whether it's within the United States, like Colorado, Delaware, Nevada, and so on, they escape the negative criticisms, or whether they do so in some of the leading ones around the world, Cayman Islands, Bahamas, and so on. Um, so, so International capital is not giving up on financial centers anytime soon as they, yeah, as they yeah. deepen their quest mm-hmm. to, to, to go global. And if you look at China, 
China has over 100 state-owned enterprises on the Fortune 500, uh, as part of the Fortune 500 companies. And there are as many as 80% of those 100 companies that are immersed in stock exchange activity. As part of parcel of their um, global profile and so on, they will also diversify their reliance on the financial services that Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai provide. And they may look for other provinces outside of China because of geopolitics, because they're beginning to grow up and understand that, you know, um, seeking financial services, the best that money can buy is uh, part and parcel of what you do if you want to sustain globality, right? So we must understand that um, international tax competition, I say this to my friend R, international tax competition has not ended, will not end. And so you don't just give up on a niche that you've had a history and a legacy extending back to plantation, the plantation era. You just don't give up on that. Uh, we'll give up on the exploitation of, of people. We'll give up on uh, the indignities that people have had to suffer. We'll give up on all those things that are negative. But the, the mere fact that um, our societies uh, feature, I mean, we came into history, we as a middle class in the Barbados came into history because of running, because we ran corner shops, because we ran barber shops, and because we as children of them were told go and do the professions mm -hmm. go and become a lawyer go and become a doctor go and become a, a teacher go and be why because through the the growth of professions was valorized or celebrated in the barbadian culture you know you go and you get some you know go and get a degree and so on all that's part and parcel of that legacy left behind of a growth industry rooted in the professions, mm -hmm. servicing that industry and encouraging culturally this notion that you can achieve self-actualization through uh, civil service work and growing professions and, and immerse yourself in the professions. Uh, so um, there is, I'm not about to part with that legacy and I don't think that's a, that's a way in which we should proceed. Okay. Right, we, we're getting down in time a bit. We have a, a probably a, like 15 to 20 minutes left. So there's two other topics I really want us to, um, to talk about before we end. Um, the first one is land reform. One of the things that I've always been concerned about is our relationship with the land because, you know, that comes with a myriad of comp complications born out of our history. Um, it is often said that one of our biggest failures um, as a nation was failing to redistribute the, redistribute the land uh, independence, um, you know, when it would have been easier to do so. And Terry, as he, he always says, um, that we don't necessarily have to come up with the ideas ourselves, but um, that we can look at what other people are doing, other countries or states are doing, and uh, reformat those ideas to fit our reality. Now, and I, I obviously agree with that sentiment, and that's why um, in looking at Scotland, uh, how they've dealt with, with, with land redistribution, I find that to be interesting. And um, for those of you who might not be aware, who, li who are listening, the, the Land Reform Scotland Act um, saw collective interest in land as, as an alternative. And, and obviously, collective, the collective interest would be those people who um, are farmers and so forth. Fiona McKenzie, they argue that um, there are political possibilities, and I, I will quote a little bit now, I think, yeah. There are political possibilities that are created when land is removed as a, a commodity from circuits of global capital. And uh, then in areas under crossing tenure, it comes under collective ownership, and they argue that rights to the land may be inherited, but they are all also evolving and that um, situ situational pro pragmatism is at work as the trust, because they have a, a trust that, that has worked out. Um, these, these collectives, the trust might, which might, um, might be construed to be more closely project, um, which discriminate in 
favor of a local interest. In this way, the farmers then can own and produce from the land to the benefit of all, instead of elitists owning and, 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 and solely benefiting. How, how, what do you think about that in Barbados, given our history um, with the land, given um, you know, how, how we navigate that space in Barbados? Okay, one of the greatest pieces of legislation since independence was to do with the Territories Act. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right? Um, I mean, that began to address the question of popular ownership of land in Barbados. One of the greatest right. pieces of legislation we've ever had. That's, yeah. that's up there with free education and, and all the social benefits that we've grown accustomed to in Barbados. And while that was done, subsequently we've sort of abandoned the philosophical moorings that drove that innovative and enlightened um, way of proceeding mm -hmm. uh, in the direction of having the land fetch its highest value. So you've had prime beachfront and West Coast lands and other lands uh, have been, you know, sold to um, foreigners, really, not under any alien, uh, and, and, and not any other, not, un, not under any notions of uh, a lease, but they've been sold. And this is unfortunate. We've had some reaction to that um, by various pockets of civil society and that has led to to my mind a slowing down or at least a deliberate attempt to preserve other areas in the eastern part of the island and so on as land that will not be sold and the rest of it but in essence what we're what we're faced with is uh, the burden of bad ideas and policy in relation to land that right now what can be salvaged from various successive administrations approach to land in Barbados, the best that can be salvaged in the 2020s is one where we, are, we have these kinds of land lease arrangements with farmers in the direction of food security and so on. Because um, as it stands right now, 166 square miles, there are limitations to um, what has gone before. And I've seen that in terms of housing remains, housing remains a demand. And we are running out of literally of spaces to put houses to meet, to, to meet that popular demand. And with the need for some kind of uh, agricultural policy in the direction of food security, we have at least about 30,000 hectares of land that can be earmarked for uh, some kind of land lease project with farmers for the good of themselves uh, and the good of the country. Um, I, I must admit to you that beyond what the state does in the name of the public trust with lands that it holds, I cannot at this moment perceive or conceive of a redistribution of land that will meet, you know, uh, stellar, you know, the stellar conditions that at the time of independence uh, stood before us. So right now we have large landowners and their influence, influencers who are persuaded by the argument will say, but the state and black people own most of the land, right? And they were getting to facetious arguments about what is within the repository of the state versus what is in the repository of private hands. Um, but you and I understand what equity is about in relation to land distribution and the role of the state in that regard. But the land reform, uh, right now, I can't see it moving beyond um, land held in the public trust to serve the public interest. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, couldn't be any more 
a revolution. I mean, well, you're, you're, you're about to, I know it doesn't look as though that's what she wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, mean, I guess, well, I mean, her, the point that she made there about looking to Scotland, looking looking to other, because Scotland has a, has a, has a, an art that led to the redistribution, because Scotland had the same, had a similar issue with the clan, right? We had these, the, uh, the Scottish clans, these farm, these families, a number of families of like, large land owners, and they were able to get away from that um, by passing um, laws, not necessarily to dispossess people, but to, but to allow the, um, the people who are the farmers who are resident on the land to actually um, get a hold of the land, and the communities that are living on the land to get a hold of the, of the land um, that they actually had. I think the uh, people countries are um, reflected a lot of this. It's a, it's a pity that it was sunset legislation, but it's, um, if I'm not mistaken, if that's what it was. Um, so I, I want to pick you up though on the um, another po another um, point, well, topic that we wanted to discuss, which is rethinking the okay. um, corporate governance structures. Sorry, I know you, you want to come in. Yeah, I just want to answer this question from the audience because mm -hmm. it, it, it remains on the land before we move on to the last topic. No problem. Quickly, the tenantries, the, this is Eric Smith, he's saying the tenantries freehold purchase act has at the same time brought hardship to small landowners who are lumped with the plantations and large private owners. Um, the legislation is therefore in a tail in a, in a tail spin and uh, will need revisiting. After 40 years of the legislation, how successful has it been? Okay, I'm not, for, I'm not familiar with that area of that, that particular nuance that he's making. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer not to answer because I cannot really answer. I'm not familiar with that. Okay, I would just take it as a comment. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, we'll look at it some more. Um, yeah, with regards to other, um, like, it, it has definitely enfranchised a number of people, including including the same set farmers. Um, so as far as that is, that's concerned, it has been a, a success. Um, like, I'm not familiar, like you, I'm not familiar really with the, the other issues I may have brought out. So I will decline to comment as well. All right, so just going on to, discuss more the rethinking of the corporate governance structures. Another theme that we wanted to discuss with you, um, again, continue, continuing the same idea that um, Ayo has just put out there, which is that farmers doesn't have to come up with all these solutions themselves, right? Our, our leaders don't have to do this, right? Our leaders don't have to be complete geniuses. All they need to be able to do is to find the solutions that exist in, in, in similar countries like ourselves. That's practices, that's right. Yeah. Barbados isn't facing an issue that other countries haven't necessarily solved. Right? We, we can look for examples of best practices and try to adopt them and adapt them to our circumstances. That's all we really need to do. At least, um, I think that's, that's, that's pretty much all we need to do in order to right shape our economy. And given the, the continuing fallout of COVID, you know, we have the impact that it has had on the tourism sector. We see the, um, the owners and the, um, the, essentially the capitalist class protecting themselves. And if you're being generous, we'll say that they're being very callous with regards to workers. If you're being honest, we can say that in some instances, they're actually behaving in an illegal fashion with regards to severance pays, um, refusing to pay that, um, the abuse of the bankruptcy laws that we're seeing happening in Barbados as, as, um, as, you know, as a continuing theme in, in Barbados. Um, is it not, not, is no, not a time not to think about passing laws like many of the Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, like Germany, uh, part also of Europe, passing laws that mandate that companies of a particular size, right, of a certain size, um, of, in terms of number of workers, better represent or represent the workers themselves on the corporate boards, given that I don't expect that if the workers are on the boards, that the company would take a decision so as to disadvantage the interest of the workers. So as to, and, it, and also don't expect that the workers are on the board, that the, that, the, that the workers would take a decision and the company would take a decision so as to, so as to destroy the company, there'll be a better balance. We wouldn't have an instance of um, some unscrupulous individuals declaring bankruptcy to transfer the assets of a company of the company that's operating for that was operating for say 10, 20 years, transferring those assets to an, another company, a shell company, really selling it, then declaring yeah. bankruptcy, firing the workers from company A, 
right? And they, they wanted to rehire them at company B with a 40% pay cut. This is, these are the things that are happening. And I don't think that if workers um, made up, say, 30% of the board, these things could happen. And so the question really is, given what's happening in Barbados as a result of COVID, particularly in the tourism sector, and we're seeing this type of behavior, is it is now not a time for our government to think about passing legislation to mandate better worker representation on the boards of these companies, particularly those of particular si of, you know, of reasonable size? The maxim comes to me, uh, power concedes nothing unless pushed. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hold my breath on this government or any government based on the history. Mm -hmm. may, to pass legislation to have our corporate firms behave ethically and appropriately. Mm -hmm. I'll say this because for a long time, nothing happened to corporate Barbados until Sir Harry Beckles and others challenged uh, these companies to end their corporate injustices, right? And to recognize the rights of shareholders. Mm -hmm. We're at a moment again, because you know these, these fights have to be fought over and sometimes have to be advanced further. So you, you win that argument, you know, corporate justice 101. Mm -hmm. We are now corporate justice 201. We are in the 21st century. Interlocking directorships still obtain. Mm -hmm. Right? Insider trading still obtains. So uh, the, the reform of which you speak is a necessary corollary to um, the requirements under the Article 4 consultations that we engage with the IMF every year uh, that, that extols the need for good corporate governance to be practiced across the private sector. And that especially among publicly listed firms, but across the private sector in general, uh, as part and parcel of reforms of um, the market, market reforms. And I wonder when we are, as a government, uh, when we are engaging with the fund in looking at, comp uh, at, at putting a score representing how much we comply to corporate governance modules or corporate governance doctrines, I wonder the extent to which this percolates to anything pragmatic happening on the ground. So that the terms at which we speak, let's not pretend, they invest truly in politics. Mm. They're part and parcel of the financing of the campaigns of both major parties in Barbados, historically and, and, and up to recently. So, um, they're not likely to do anything to empower, I'm talking about the larger of the firms, the largest among the firms, to empower workers in the way in which you suggest obtain as best practice in, 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 in corporate governance. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously, you know, workers are going to be outmaneuvered, you know, outplanned, and so on. And, and it's not that, that, you see, mitigating the power relations that exist between these owners, directors of these firms does not require simply the need for trade unions to apply pressure. Workers have to find ways outside of the trade unions to become aware of what ought to be the ethical, what ought to be ethical and proper conducts and, and launch campaigns for so doing. It was not the Barbados Workers Union or the NUPW just naming two that saw, uh, you know, boardrooms in major corporate firms include blacks. It was not their struggle. You know, it, it came about because a few enlightened interests, including Lombard, Motley, Harry Beckles and others, felt enough is enough. You know, you're not going to run your um, entities as if uh, these are exclusive properties of your own design and making, you know. Uh, and it's just unfortunate that we, in this COVID moment, we are seeing all kinds of uh, corporate injustices and, um, you know, we are not getting much of civil society reacting to this at all. But, you know, it's a strange moment, you know, um, in conditions of uncertainty, workers of all gradations, yeah? 
uh, of all gradations and of all um, uh, categories find themselves a bit reticent to speak out, strike out, and make bold, you know, make bold claims of unfairness because, um, you know, they fear uh, reprisals, they fear uh, being discriminated against and so on. And this is not happening just to, um, you know, uh, union cheap things. Mm -hmm. um, this is also happening to um, uh, others that work in, in these sectors that feel constrained to say anything. I mean, the hotel sector is replete with this kind of activity. And um, right now my eyes are on the distribution firms. Christmas is gone, we are into the new year. And I'm gonna be looking to see if the distribution or retail outlets start to, to behave oddly and differently, you know? Um, but it is, um, you know, the major corporations in Barbados really are, are not acting accordingly and the, the administration of the day was, is in power and uh, should be mindful to follow the Labour Minister's uh, warning at the, end of the, at the end of 2020, where he was asking for, asking employers to conduct themselves in socially responsible ways. So we'll see. Hopefully. It's sad, really. It's sad. You know, um, it's really, really sad. Yeah, I, I sometimes I, I hate to end the program. That's <laughs> true because it, I like I'm enjoying it so much. And this is one of the program. Um, and you can usually tell when I don't want to end the program because we go past seven o'clock. And <laughs> you can tell when it's good because the audience stays. Yeah. <laughs> Both of those things are happening right now. It's past seven o'clock and the audience has stayed. But we, we do need to end it because we need to respect time. Yeah. Right. Um, so but thank I you, really Don. I really want you to come back. Um, I'm not sure it's yet because this season is kind of um, thing packed up. Sure, so. But I, I really want you to come back because there's so much. There's so much I think that that still needs to be. Um, um, yeah, plus still. Yeah, so many time. things. Yeah, so we need to have you again. Yeah. So thank you for coming. Um, you want to say anything um, for the final before you go? Yeah, just that. I didn't get a chance to, but hopefully others will get a chance to map out what is meant by advancing human dignity in our parts. You know, what kind of social charter rights need to be constructed. Um, you know, we have to begin to consider if a right to employment is a social good that needs to be advanced. And we can always talk about the practical solutions to making that principle stick. And it could take the form of ensuring that there's a certain kind of household income that should obtain for any any family that finds themselves where finds the adults not working that you know they should receive some kind of minimum household income mm -hmm. as a way of activating what is meant by saying going forward that unemployment is something that we want to to treat as a scourge and a problem right now. Youth unemployment is such a huge issue. It was a huge issue before COVID. It will exacerbate. We have the highest rates in the region. Our institute here at Sir Arthur Lewis Institute have mm -hmm. already done that research. We have the highest rates. It will grow on claim after COVID. We are in an emergency situation, and if we don't tackle unemployment in and of itself mm -hmm. as a social problem, I find a creative way to address that then uh, we can lose our societies to violence, to hopelessness, uh, and the rest of it. So there's more, more to be done other than what we've attempted today, for sure. And may others enjoy the conversation. Definitely. Well, thank you so much again for coming. Um, thank you very much. Thank you also to those of you who took the time to join us today, those of you who shared with us your comments, your questions, and even your ideas. Um, I really want to thank you for that. Remember to keep an eye on the page and you will, you will see how you can win a death pad, um, as I said earlier. And also remember to wash your hands. Remember to sanitize, wear your mask, practice physical distancing. Distancing. <laughs> <laughs>
if you enjoyed this episode, please share this page and invite your friends to join us right here again next Sunday at 5 p.m. To you, my co-host, Terry, thank you for being here. And again, to the hard work that you continue to do to help to produce this show so successfully. Until next week. Thanks, Ayo. Um, thanks to the audience. And thanks, Dr. Marshall, for being here. Um, there's a lot for us to discuss. Um, you know, there's yet the theme of taxation and tax reform. We didn't get to it on that, but hopefully next time, as Ayo said, hopefully next time we'll be able to continue the discussion on these themes and, and more themes because it's a, it's a narrative or it's a, it's a discussion that we need to, we need to have um, going forward. All right, so with that, thank you and thanks to the audience again and we'll see you next week. <laughs>